welcome to Riceville United Methodist. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm so glad that you took the time to worship with us here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. As we begin our worship service today, I've got a series of announcements that are going to come in groups of threes. The first is a triathlon of sporting events that are um, going to help us um, do fundraisers for local missions right here in our own area. And the first is golfing. The second is running, and the third is yard sailing. Now, you might think that's not a sporting event, but you tell that to the people who line up at 6 a.m. to get the very best deals. Our first uh, event is the golf tournament, which starts a week from Monday out at Cape Fear Country Club. If you'd like to sign up or be a whole sponsor, you can contact the church or contact Hayes Perry. All of the funds, um, all the proceeds from the golf tournament will go to our Methodist men, which help local projects right here in our own area. The second event is the upcoming Sun Run 5K, in which you can run or walk on October the 9th to help raise money for people who are struggling with housing. And our proceeds from that event are going to go to Eden Village, to warm and to a safe place. And remember, you can practice for that by coming out on Tuesdays at 4.15 to walk the loop with the pastors. The third event, as I mentioned, is the yard sale. That's the weekend of November 13th. It's still a long ways away, but I want you to get that on your calendar and so you can start collecting items for that upcoming event. All right, our next seri series of three is three upcoming studies. The first study is going to be led by Reverend David Gehring. It's about the letters of Paul and how the Apostle Paul used his letter writing to inspire churches during turbulent times. That's going to begin this Wednesday at 10 a.m. here at the church. This Thursday morning at 645, before the, most people are even beginning their day, our men's Bible study will be starting a new study of the book of James. So if you want to be a part of the men's Bible study, Thursday mornings, 645. And then thirdly, our upcoming confirmation class for those that are in 7th grade or above, that are youth-aged, 7th grade or above, um, is going to start on October the 6th. And so I'd love for you to sign up for that if you're interested. Contact Christina Norville or contact the church and we'll get you signed up for confirmation classes. Our third section of announcements is all about worship. And we've got a really special worship event planned for next Sunday at 6.30 at the South Channel Park where we're going to have a service of lament to simply share our struggles dealing with COVID and so many other things that are going on in our lives. And so come on out to South Channel Park at uh, 6.30 next Sunday, p.m., p.m., um, and we're going to have that worship service. And, and it's going to take place with Holy Communion. Why don't you to be aware of that? Also, World Communion Sunday is taking place in two weeks, and we're going to do that both online and in person. I'll tell you a little bit more, give you some more instructions about how we're going to, to participate in World Communion Sunday next week, but wanted you to be aware. And then thirdly, if you would like to um, put flowers in the church in honor of someone, um, please call the church office. We'd love to, to set that up for you. And we're looking for people who have the ability to arrange these beautiful flower arrangements. And so if you have that gift, um, would love for you to contact the church or contact Julia Walker Jewell, our music director and worship director, um, because we'd love to get some more help on that. Um, thanks so much. Finally, last but not least, did you sign up for Realm last week? Because this is going to be the best way to stay in touch with people from church. And this is how we're going to be communicating with you over the next few months. So I hope that you took the time to sign up for Realm. And if you need to find out more about that, of course, call the church office. Thanks so much. I think that's all the announcements we have this morning. Let's continue to worship the Lord our God.
I invite you to bow your heads for prayer. Gracious and loving God, we bless you for giving us the grace through this week. For you have provided all of our needs so that we were never lacking in anything, even though there were moments when we may have complained. We worship your holy name this day and pray that you will accept our worship in Jesus' name. As we gather today from places far and wide, we ask that we might feel your presence among us. And for all who've taken this time to worship, we hope that we won't conclude this service the same way that we started. At the end of everything, let us glorify your name for a joy-filled, spirit-inspired time in your presence. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you now to join with me in the recitation of the Apostles' Creed. You'll find the words at the bottom of the screen. Let us affirm that which we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, whose walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Why should I feel discouraged? 
Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he cares for me. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he cares for me. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Let not your heart be troubled, his tender word I hear, and resting on his goodness, I lose my doubts and fears. Though by the path he leadeth, but one step I may see, his eyes on the sparrow, and I know he cares for me. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he's watching me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he cares for me. And now we have the great privilege of going to God in prayer. And as I lead us in prayer, I'm going to pause during the prayer to give you the opportunity to lift up the names of individuals and situations about whom you're concerned. You may do that by speaking your concerns out loud or in the silence of your heart. Let us pray. Lord God, the storms of life are raging, and we need you to stand by us. The winds are trying to toss us to and fro, and we need you to stand by us. We want to be prosperous like the tree planted by the streams of water that the psalmist talked about. We too want to yield fruit, but life is threatening our productivity. Some of us are so stressed that our leaves are starting to wither. God, we need you to order our steps and give us the strength to handle whatever is on the path that you have assigned us. Show us your grace and your favor. And Lord God, we especially pray today for these whom we now name with our voices or in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your promise to never forsake us or leave us. Help us to live lives through which you bless others. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. And as he taught his disciples to pray, so now we also pray as God's confident children, praying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The psalmist said, Behold, God is my helper. God is the upholder of my life. With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O God, for it is good. For you have delivered me from every trouble. We find those words in Psalm 54. And it reminds us that it is because God gives us blessings each and every day that we worship God by giving offerings to God out of gratitude. And we're especially thankful for the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. You can worship God with your giving at a live worship service or by mailing checks to P.O. Box 748 in Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, or through our website or the cell phone app. Let us pray. All things come from you, O God, and with gratitude we return to you what is yours. You gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. All that we are and all that we have is a trust from you. Living and loving God, accept all that we offer you as we worship you in our giving. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen.
Now it's time for the children's sermon. I'm Pastor David, one of the associate pastors here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and I'm looking forward to sharing something very important with the kids this morning. So if you have children nearby who aren't already watching the service, now's a good time to call them over uh, for the children's sermon. So, hey guys, got something to share with you today. Um, this Sunday in our 1030 live service at the church, we are actually having a baptism. And so I wanna talk to you kids for a moment about baptism. Now, in Christian churches, baptism is that ceremony in which we use water as a kind of initiation into the church. And in United Methodist churches, sometimes we baptize babies, sometimes we baptize children and youth, sometimes we baptize adults and even older adults. Some of you kids were probably already baptized when you were a baby on the promise of your parents and others to make sure that you learned about the Christian faith as you grow up. And then when you're around 12 or so, uh, you have the opportunity to go through confirmation, which is a series of classes in which you learn a whole lot more about your faith and you're encouraged to make a profession of faith, which is your decision to believe in Jesus and be a Christian. Now, in the United Methodist Church, we use just a little bit of water for our baptism. And we can use a lot of water, and sometimes we do, but most of the time, we just use a little bit of water. Now, you might wonder, what possible difference can such a little bit of water make? Well, I want to illustrate it uh, for you. Does anybody know what this is? Well, this is actually a ceramic bird whistle. I bought this in Europe a couple of years ago in Budapest, Hungary. And um, well, it's a bird whistle. So listen, and you'll see how I can call birds with it. Well, isn't that great? Let me do it again. Now, what kind of bird does that sound like? I know, right? It doesn't sound like any bird I ever heard. <laughs> that, do you think that maybe I didn't get my money's worth or, you know, what's a problem here? Well, I left out one part. So I'm going to dip this into a little bit of water. And let's try it again. Wow, now that begins to sound like a bird, doesn't it? <laughs> what made the difference? A little bit of water. A little bit of water made all the difference in the world. And in the same way, the little bit of water that we use in baptism can make a big difference in your life. In baptism, God is working in your life to claim you for God's very own, and to do some special things in your life. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for baptism. We are grateful if we've already been baptized, or we look forward with anticipation to the time when we will be baptized. We thank you that that little bit of water can make such a big difference in our lives as we are brought into your church and into the family of God. We thank you for the children and youth that are watching this video today. Bless them and their families. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, I'm Pastor Julia Crone, one of the associate pastors here. Please join me now uh, in looking towards our scripture lesson for this morning, which comes to us from the book of Genesis, starting in chapter 37, verses one through eight. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, 
was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that his father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Once Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream that I dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field. Suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. Then your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. And now continuing on to Genesis chapter 50, starting at verse 15. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us for us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph saying, your father gave us this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, we are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. I have always been what you might call a chronic optimist, but this week I may have reached a positivity breaking point. I was on a Zoom call with some of my fellow pastors and the conversation turned to something that's very common at this time in our lives. All of the good things that have come from the pandemic. Our church realized the building isn't as important as we once thought it was, one enthusiastic pastor said. Another person said, I can have quick meetings with people from all over the country and we don't have to pay for travel. Yet another said, I can finally get so much more done without all the distractions of in-person meetings. Everyone sort of looked to me and I unmuted and said, you know what? I am sick of Zoom. I hate looking at a screen. I never, if I never had to log on to another meeting in my life, I would rejoice. I am sick of all of this. I want to be together again. Even for a chronic optimist like myself, there are days when this pandemic seems just too awful to overcome. There are days when I look around the world and I struggle to imagine how God could turn it all around. But on days like that, Joseph's story makes me think twice. Our story starts with Joseph, the 17-year-old son of Israel's patriarch, Jacob. He's one of 12 brothers, but he is Jacob's favorite, and he knows it. You might think that a guy with 10 older brothers would be wearing hand-me-downs, but no. While the rest of Joseph's brothers were wearing Costco brand sweatshirts, Jacob brought 
Joseph a brand new Patagonia quarter zip in a limited edition color. So Joseph's brothers were already irritated with him. And then came the dreams. One day the brothers were all hanging around the kitchen table when they see Joseph rolling up after school, speeding around the corner in his brand new Jeep. He walks into the house like he owns the place, backpack slung over, a short, over his shoulder and locking the car behind him. He pushes Asher aside to make room for himself at the table and grabs that last slice of pizza that Levi had been reaching for. So guess what, he says. I had this crazy dream last night. We were all working in the field and binding our sheaves of grain. Then all of a sudden, Mine stood up, and it was way bigger and taller than all of yours. And then all of yours made a circle around mine and bowed down. Now, Joseph's brothers might not have been their daddy's favorite, but they weren't stupid. They got what this dream was about. Joseph was telling them that one day they would all bow down to him and that he would rule them. Uh-uh, no way. He can have his fancy jacket and our dad's attention, but this has gone too far. He is not going to rule over us. So they hatched a plan. They beat him up and almost left him for dead, but then they got a better idea. Ishmaelite tradesmen were passing through the area, so the brothers made a trade their brother Joseph, for 20 pieces of silver. Joseph is led into a strange land by strange people. Up until now, Joseph has spent his entire life with his family. He's lived in the center of God's promise to bless Israel. Now he's forced to go somewhere he has never been, with people who are very different from the ones that he knows. His brothers have betrayed him. He's cut off from his people, from his family, their customs, his home. But it's here, at this point in the story, that this line appears over and over. The Lord was with Joseph. Not for one moment is Joseph truly abandoned. When the story is at its scariest, darkest point, God has still not left Jacob, Joseph, alone. Even the specific name used here for God helps communicate this. The Hebrew says that Yahweh is with Joseph. That's Israel's specific, special, sacred name for God. Even when Joseph's people abandon him, the God of his people remains faithful. God's presence with Joseph makes him succeed even under strange circumstances. He's sold as a slave to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's military officers. But even as a slave, Joseph quickly becomes the number two guy in Potiphar's household. It's all going great until Potiphar's wife starts to notice how good that young new manager looks in his tunic. She starts propositioning him, saying, come lie with me. When Joseph says no, it doesn't go over very well with Mrs. Potiphar. She frames Joseph and makes it look as though he was the one trying to force her into bed. Potiphar is enraged and throws Joseph in prison. Joseph is in jail for several years, seemingly without hope. Then things go bump in the night. Pharaoh has a series of terrible dreams that are haunting him. He brings together all of his royal advisors, the magicians, the priests, the wise men, and none of them can say what the dreams mean. They don't have a clue. Someone in Pharaoh's household had heard about Joseph and his ability to interpret dreams. Immediately, Joseph is sprung from jail and brought into Pharaoh's courts to hear the dream. And the interpretation is clear to Joseph. There will be seven years of plentiful harvests, Crops so successful, there won't even be room to store all the food. But after that, there will be seven years of famine. Based on the interpretation, Joseph makes a recommendation. 
Find someone you can trust with exceptional management skills. Have that person oversee the farmers for the next seven years to collect and store a portion of the food so that it can be rationed and distributed in the years of famine. Well, Joseph gets this job that he dreamt of. He's freed from his shackles and is given instead Pharaoh's own signet ring, the sign of royal authority. He's given the finest linen garments that would make even his coat of many colors look shabby. He will lead Egypt, second only to Pharaoh himself. Things have never been better for Joseph. The bumper crops keep coming just as he said they would, and he oversees all the farming. When the years of famine come, Egypt isn't worried. They have grain to spare, thanks to Joseph's savvy management. They have so much to spare, in fact, that the word gets out to the surrounding regions. There's food in Egypt. The news even reaches the land of Canaan, where an old man lives with his 11 sons. Jacob sends the brothers to Egypt to find food. Even after all these years, Joseph recognizes the brothers immediately. But when they look at him, all they see is a powerful man who holds their fate in his hands. They bow down on the ground before him and beg for food. When Joseph reveals his identity, the shocked brothers call for Jacob to join them. The whole family, servants, animals, everyone, move to Egypt. And they're safe and secure because Joseph was in Egypt and had planned for the fam famine as Pharaoh's right-hand man. But the brothers don't feel secure in their relationship with Joseph. They worry that he's only allowing them to stay alive out of love and loyalty for Jacob. So when Jacob dies, the brothers come before Jacob. And again, they bow down before him and tell him that they are his slaves. Time stands still for Joseph. He's drawn back to the dream of so many years ago, the dream of sheaves of grain bowing down to him. When he dreamt it at 17, Joseph was giddy with the glitter of the future he imagined for himself. His brothers would know their place. He would finally be seen and known and respected for what he was, the best, the golden boy. He thrilled with the thought of the power that he would have and how he could wield it over his brothers. And here it is, the perfect moment for revenge fantasies to become reality. Joseph has the power to kill the brothers, or at the very least to make their lives as miserable as possible to pay for all that they have done to him. So what will he say? Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I will provide for you and for your little ones. Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good. At some point in the pain of the last years, Joseph allowed God to transform him into the sort of person who was able to forgive his brothers, who was able to see something good in the midst of suffering. Joseph goes from relishing the thought of his brothers kneeling before him to asking them to stand as his equal. The suffering he endures becomes fertile ground for Joseph to grow into the person God wants him to be. Sometimes, it takes desperate times to get us onto our knees, vulnerable and willing to let God work how he needs to in our hearts. God uses this terrible evil to work on Joseph. Joseph becomes more of the person God wants him to be because of this. 
But the redemption God is up to doesn't stop with Joseph's individual life. This isn't just some sort of biblical success montage. Instead, God is at work for the good of the entire Israelite community. Our story is focused on Joseph, but at the start of the scripture passage, the narrator tells us this is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph is important because he is Jacob's son and Isaac's grandson and Abraham's great-grandson. God promised Abraham that he would be blessed and that he would be the father of a great nation and that through his family, all the nations of the world would be blessed. The family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is supposed to be a family that conveys God's blessing to the whole world. They are to be fruitful, to be vibrant and filled with life. Jacob's sons betray this calling when they try to kill Joseph. And yet God doesn't abandon them. God doesn't give up on Israel, even though they are actively working against God's life-giving purposes. Instead, God finds a way to turn this death-dealing act into something that will eventually preserve life. Jacob's family tried to kill one of its own, and God turns that into a way to keep the whole family alive for generations to come. Even though good comes from it, I don't think that it was God's idea for Joseph's brothers to sell him into slavery. I don't believe that God makes bad things happen. In the Gospel of John, Jesus gives us a pretty clear way to determine what is from God and what is not. He says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. If something is stealing, killing, and destroying, it's not from God. That is not what God does. Jesus is in the business of life, even more of abundant life, of life to the full. And because God's purposes are always for life, God works even terrible things into good. Sometimes I think about it this way. On the cooking TV show Chopped, contestants are given a basket filled with mystery ingredients and are told, depending on what round it is, to make an appetizer, a main dish, or a dessert. Now, once they've opened up the basket and find out what's inside, they have access to a giant storeroom where they can get whatever other ingredients they need to make something delicious. The catch is that the dish has to include every ingredient from the mystery basket. And those ingredients are usually really, really weird. For example, in one episode, the contestants were challenged to create a dessert using the following. A whole coconut, cherry cola sorbet, marzipan fruit, and dried tarantula. What's amazing is that the contestants somehow still manage to turn these weird ingredients into something incredible. The competition is a challenge because the contestants not only need to be great at cooking technically, but they have to be incredibly creative. I wonder if maybe that's how God works all things together for our good. God doesn't always choose the ingredients. Us human beings with our free will make choices. And then God rolls up his sleeves, puts on his apron and says, okay, I can work with that. The powers of evil do their worst in the world. And still God is up for the challenge. God is able to take even the most unlikely ingredients and turn it into something that moves his good purposes forward. God will creatively work all things together for good. But he doesn't usually do it in the way that we think is best. I bet if you asked Joseph what he wanted God to do for him, 
as he was on his way to Egypt with the Ishmaelites or when he was in prison, it would have been to go back to Canaan. I bet he just wanted everything to go back to normal. He wanted back the life he had envisioned for himself. He was going to keep being Jacob's golden boy, marry an Israelite woman, make Rachel a grandmother. I'm sure our dreamer had big dreams for himself, but dreams that involved the home he knew, the people he knew. In Joseph's mind, a good outcome probably meant a return to things as they used to be. But that's not what God was up to. God was interested in taking the evil Joseph's brothers did and working it into God's loving, life-giving purposes. And that involved a future Joseph never would have imagined for himself, a future in Egypt. Read the story for yourself, and you'll see that although Joseph finds a hope and a future, he never returns to Canaan. The good God has for us isn't just restoration. It's recreation. God isn't re restoring us to a former ideal time, but is leading us forward into the future that he is creating. A future ablaze with colorful details we never would have envisioned. What God is going to come up with for our future is way better than anything that we could imagine. And I'd rather bet on God's dream, even if I don't know what it is, than rely on my own strength to make my own dreams happen. Here's the other thing about God's creative work. We don't get to set the timeline. We're living in the middle of a story that is still being written. One where evil is continually being caught up into God's dreams for the world, but where evil still continues to exist. It even happens in Joseph's story. It seems that we reach a happy ending, a conclusion at the end of Genesis, with the Israelites safely protected in Egypt. But turn the page, and the Israelites have become slaves oppressed by an Egyptian government that no longer cares about Joseph. There are new problems that require God's creative, redemptive work. How are we possibly to live in this in-between time? When I was a little girl, I was completely obsessed with Andrew Lloyd Webber's musical, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. It tells the story of Joseph, but with dance numbers and fun, anachronistic touches. Well, at the lowest point of the story, where Joseph seems completely hopeless, when he's thrown in jail after being falsely accused of sleeping with Potiphar's wife, he's encouraged by the musical's characters. In the middle of the jail, dancers dressed in 1960s disco clothes flood the stage and start singing a song called Go, 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 Joseph. There's one line from the song I've always loved. They sing, don't give up, Joseph. Fight till you drop. We've read the book and you come out on top. The whole thing is a wonderful, fun way to break the fourth wall. The people who have been narrating the story break into our main character's hopelessness to encourage him. They already know Joseph's story, and so they know what happens. They've read the book, and Joseph comes out on top. Well, friends, I've read the book, and God comes out on top. I've read the book, and at the end, God wipes away every tear from our eyes. I've read the book, and in the end, Jesus is on the throne, and we see his face. I've read the book, and death is defeated, and mourning is over, and pain is no more, and God is with us. We are living in an in-between time. We're existing in the middle of the story, 
somewhere between here and here. And I don't know how long it will be before all of the suffering that we're challenged by right now will be caught up into God's life-giving purposes. But God's creativity hasn't failed yet. God is still undefeated. There is nothing the powers of evil can throw at God that he can't eventually work for our good. So don't give up, friends. I've read the book, and God comes out on top. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for your boundless creativity. Thank you for the ways that you can transform even the darkest, most hopeless situations in our lives into bright, colorful visions of the future. God, be with us in our struggles and help us to trust the vision that you have, the dreams you have for your world. Help us to trust that you intend all things for our good. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, we are living in a difficult time, in a time where it is easy for us to feel hopeless. But I've read the book, and in the end, God wins. So go in the knowledge of God's ultimate victory. And as you go, may the spirit of the living God, made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord, go before you to show you the way go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own, go above you to watch over you and protect you, go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand, go beside you to be your companion and dwell within you to remind you every day that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace.